Anita, welcome. I am delighted to talk with you today about metaphors and in particular your perspective on why metaphors matter. So I'm just going to invite you to um, share a little bit about uh, how you came to focus on metaphors and um, your perspective on why they're important. Thanks so much, Sandra. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Yeah, my work is in metaphors in general. I've always really loved uh, language and I came into thinking about the carbon footprint metaphor, especially in terms of mediating cultural politics of climate change. But in those studies of metaphor, I really started to think about uh, metaphors that we can't do without them, right? Metaphors really matter uh, to our way of being in the world. We use metaphors constantly. You can think, um, maybe just pause all of anyone who's watching this, pause for a day and think about the metaphors that they use as they're going through the day. You might say, how are you feeling? I'm feeling up or I'm feeling down. All of those are metaphorical ways of expressing how we are feeling or what we're navigating through in the world. So metaphors are not just literary frills is, is one of the main points I wanna um, convey in my research that we use them all the time. They're everyday practical uh, tools that we navigate through the world. Um, so they matter, uh, they matter in terms of getting us through the world. They help to reduce complexity um, not in a poetic way, but just in terms of understanding um, how we understand issues. So in my recent work, I looked at COVID-19 and the way that we use war metaphors to mobilize action around the pandemic. So we can think about war metaphors as coming, uh, bringing certain good things with them, that is, when we have a, mo a war, we mobilize around something, suddenly we can get a lot done that we couldn't before, right? So think of things that have been mobilized during times of war, whole economic systems have been rearranged um, and you know we've come together in terms of how to care for each other and social distance. So that war metaphor is really a useful one for public mobilization in terms of COVID-19. But the other aspect of my my studies of metaphor has to do with what else do metaphors bring in that are sort of unintended or potentially troubling notions as well. So when we think about war, we have to mobilize against enemies. So in this sense, COVID-19 itself could be an enemy, but there are a whole range of other enemies that are sort of brought in with this metaphor. So we can think of the anti-Asian uh, hate crimes that have happened since uh, COVID-19 have started. These, of course, are bringing in um, histories that have long existed anti-Asian hate, but that it's kind of ramped up in this time because certain people think that the enemy combatants are those who have are perceived to have brought in this virus. So that's one of the problems with the war metaphor here. I also discuss in a chapter I've written uh, about front lines and who's kind of sacrificed or or casualties of war. So while that war metaphor is good on the one hand, especially for, in terms of public responses quickly to adjust to something, it's going to carry in a whole pile of other things that may be not appropriate to caring society. So what, el what else are we missing when we have a particular metaphor? Yeah, so the final point uh, that kind of frames my theories around uh, metaphor is that they shift for a variety of different agendas. So as much as we might want to mobilize one particular metaphor to do all the work of one particular agenda, they do shift in different contexts. So to go back to the war metaphor in the pandemic against COVID, that war metaphor also brings in a lot of other kinds of um, sort of enemy combatant hate types of issues. So white supremacy, as we can see, has been mobilized in that war metaphor, along with a kind of a caring notion where you think about caring for the home front and the nation and who's not going to be cared for. Well, we see even within our own national boundaries or communities that certain people are left out and that um, the war metaphor gives us, as these protests will show you, a whole suite of, you know, anti-masker becomes a kind of a 
tiki torch bearing um, white supremacist rally as well. So the enemy combatant can be um, really troubling for, for racial uh, equality and all kinds of other intersectional issues. Thank you, Anita. And it's interesting as I listen to you talk because there's so many metaphors that we use in counseling, um, metaphors that are brought in by our clients, metaphors that come from our discipline, um, metaphors that maybe we generate together in the conversation. And one of the things that I heard you say in an earlier talk was that um, metaphors function in a way to to shine the spotlight on some things, um, like you've noted here around some of the things that came out around the pandemic and the war metaphor, and also then by default, um, invisibilize other aspects or other perspectives or other experiences. And so I wonder if you wanna um, talk a little bit about that for a second. Sure, yeah. And just hearing from your disciplines, um, health disciplines, that shift between the patient uh, metaphor um, how a paradigm shift gets enacted through a kind of understanding that maybe the patient metaphor is pathologizing mental health as someone having deficiencies and someone else on another side correcting that or, or helping someone through it. So the shift from patient um, to client perspective seems like a, a key from, from my outside perspective, a key paradigm shift that might be empowering in certain ways. So empowering clients who are um, users of services, it seems like it kind of evens out a playing field in a sense. And that, um, you know, you're thought of as, as someone who is worthy of services rather than a pathologized person. Okay, so yeah, in terms of the client relationship, I think that's a really productive move that um, people in your field have thought about to shift the perspective. What does it mean to shift from a patient perspective to a client perspective? What does it enable? enable? But what does a client uh, relationship also invisibilize? So if it's purely an economic relationship with a client who is getting services, does that fully enable a whole suite of other collaborative health uh, conversations that can happen. So is the client uh, someone with whom you collaborate or is this a kind of a paid for service that you're delivering? Um, so I guess those are the questions I would ask in your profession. What does each metaphor enable or permit you to do in that relationship? What does it function? How does it orient your discussion with that client? And then, if you think of other ways, even decolonizing or critical race perspectives on those kind of health relations, what uh, does that invisibilize? So is that how communities themselves would cast the kind of relationship that you're having? Um, so yeah, that's a, just a question around not, neither, neither one is good or bad necessarily in itself, but how does each metaphor function to create a path towards a relationship uh, between the practitioners and the clients and also in that person's health journey, right? So journey is of course another one that you probably use quite a bit with your clients if you're thinking about health journeys or um, life journeys. It's interesting to have this conversation about some of this terminology because we've spent a lot of time in this ebook talking about the words that we use and the ways in which we frame um, the practice of counseling. And I think client is a great one because we've, um, we've seen that shift away from the medical model towards a more health centered and client centered model. And yet I think we have to critically think about even that term client and um, what that means and how we position our relationship and the implications for relationships. So that's really, I think a helpful thing for um, people who are watching this video to consider. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting uh, model in um, critical disability studies as well. It goes from the sort of, you probably know this too, the, the medical model to the social model um, where, the, where the society is deficient in some ways mm. from serving the people with disabilities to a cultural model. And the cultural model is interesting, isn't it? Because it talks about more collaboration. 
So if if there is kind of a collaborative community endeavor in making health, mental health, social health, um, then what would that look like? That might be an interesting uh, thing to think in terms of individuals and uh, communities of practice. Mm -hmm. What would it look like for a particular two-way relationship? What would it look for? What look like in a, a larger situation if people could determine their own metaphors mm -hmm. for their own life journey and or a relationship? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the the last part is really the key. You know, who determines the metaphor? Mm -hmm. And how do we invite forward metaphors that serve the needs of the particular person or community or issue that we're addressing? Mm -hmm. And disciplines need metaphors too, right? So that that is the those dis the metaphors that we use in our disciplines really do shape our disciplines in in generative ways, so that we can have a common set of practices and languages to work with, as you mentioned that. That has to be part of what is learned in your program and what is learned in communities of practice. So the metaphors aren't bad. We just need to attend to them and sort of make it a conscious thing, which, you know, that's the work I think I of myself as someone who has metaphoritis. I, I can't, I can't not think about metaphors, but then it leaves you with this critical impulse all the time to examine that and to say, oh, that metaphor is actually drawing on this sort of microaggression over here or something like that. So you, you, you want to, you want to have just enough um, attention to metaphor to be critical of it, but not to have it undermine your practice, because I think that's, that is important for your set of disciplines or fields to have shared vocabulary that map onto practices. Mm -hmm. And to, and I think to make sure that, like you said, we are intentionally choosing Mm -hmm. that vocabulary from that critical lens. Mm -hmm. 